an expert. I'm, I'm saying this, I, I don't would normally say it, but because there are very legal scholars here and everything, and so I'm trying to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how to conceptualize it vis-a-vis -vis mostly the Constitution and some of the older sort of, uh, some of those kinds of debates. I'm trying to then see, okay, because this is a very new kind of situation, right? So I, I think it's worthwhile to go back to what is still the sort of the, the normative, the key moment in sort of Indian history, which is basically, you know, let's say the constitutional moment, right? Because there the idea, I mean, that's, we're still working within all of those very traditional ideas of, say, disadvantage or, uh, you know, the so-called disadvantage class. And now we're trying to sort of say this, this is a new disadvantage class. But it fits uneasily there. So that's, I think, the, the, the key dilemma, right? Because you're not, this, this uh, digitally, you know, um, disadvantage, I'm just using the word because that's kind of the word they use. Uh, world is not disadvantaged in a traditional sort of sense, right? So traditionally you'd say, okay, minorities, you'd say, you know, Muslims are disadvantaged in a particular way in this country. They're a minority. So there's protection of minority rights, you know, and, and other religions. Similarly, you'll have, you know, around caste in India. So there's a recognition that, okay, these people don't have these kinds of uh, advantages or rights or they need to be protected in a particular way. So now how does, if it, this is a, an easy world to put within that vocabulary, but that's kind of what we have, right? So I, I think it's worthwhile looking at some of that history just to see how this sort of d the digitally disenfranchised or you know, disentitled uh, can make claims because it's a very complicated claim even in, even in some of the, in, in the Constitution. So I'll revisit some of those issues and you'll have to actually in your head see how this applies to, you know, whether, how it applies to the extent that it does apply and where it differs from a traditional notion of a disadvantaged class, right? Because you know, you're not digitally disenfranchised in the way you're, say, uh, a, a, a Dalit or whatever, right? I mean, there's a, there's a different axis at work here, right? So it's, how does one conceptualize this new kind of political movement? Because everything now has to be different. Because the whole identitarian position is not available anymore. So that's, that's sort of, uh, Interesting, and you know, it, it has interesting parallels. Just to show that, uh, I suppose, some sort of flexibility around it. Uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not. I'm not a legal scholar, but I think you know, in connection with, say, the the Supreme Court judgment on homosexuality, I was, I found it interesting. I don't even know it's true, but you know, homosexuals trying to now say they're a minority, which is interesting because it's not clear what a minority is from the beginning. This is an ambiguity in the Constitution itself, in the sense that. Minority is not just a numerical designation, right? It is also to do with with questions of um, disadvantage, right? You, because otherwise you could be, uh, the elites are a minority too, right? So it has to have this question of uh, disadvantage. And I find actually more interesting, if you look at those debates, is the question of a cultural distinctness, right? So that actually, you just say, I come from this caste or this tribe, and I'm culturally distinct. And I'm coming to this sort of, this commons, if you like, this sort of constitution, and I'm making my case here, and I'm wanting to protect this sort of cultural distinctness that I have. That's actually the model. So this idea is in 1950 or whenever, you know, the, throughout the late 40s and early 50s, people came there from an identity position and said, protect these rights. So there's a whole, like, anthropology behind it, so every tribe will have to show it's culturally distinct. And it can be too much of a minority, because it has to make the case that this is important enough. So, you, so it's a complicated question. You can't be, you have to be a minority, you can't be too much of a minority. It has to make political sense. And you have to also have this, make this case of cultural distinctiveness. So that's, that's always interesting because how will you make that now for, a, a, let's say, a, the digitally disadvantaged, where there's actually the sense of community is entirely just the disadvantage itself, right? So you have an extremely atomized, notion of just, in some ways, all of us are disadvantaged, but you know, let's assume they are the traditionally disadvantaged people. You have to still make the case culturally that something unifies us. We have some sort of culture. We want to protect it. And that kind of you know, intuitively doesn't make sense because you know, the sense of disadvantage is coming from so many different directions. Right? It's not unified in that sense. So how does one speak of this kind of group? Right? What is the idiom in which you will use it to then say, okay, now we make a claim to this. We make a claim to this sort of, to, to these sort of um, 
uh, you know, so to this to this kind of space, and that's that's important and interesting because there the question of culture then is is actually quite central because if if it if we speak entirely in this sort of very economistic notion of access and you know which is a dominant developmental economics kind of idiom i think that's actually what gets lost but that is the notion of distinctiveness so it, it can be cured to my mind by a purely developmental kind of rhetoric because the whole history the constitutional history is also about preserving a certain kind of group a certain kind of minority and that has to make this case based on a certain distinctiveness that it's trying to protect but now we do not know how to think about this, what is distinct about this sort of group, right? Beyond the fact of simple disenfranchisement or disadvantage, right? So, um, I mean, basically, it, it's some, to put it telegraphically, like, you know, does oppression by itself constitute a group? Uh, and does it constitute a group of people who can't really know each other in any meaningful sort of sense, right? They're all over the world, all over the country. Okay. So, uh, so then there's the question of if you were this disadvantaged thing, this is also a problem right there in the debates, if you were a minority, how permanent is this sort of question, right? This was a cause of a, a big debate because the whole idea then was, and this was a view taken not just by the majority but even by the members of this group, that in the nature of this thing, this disadvantage has to be temporary, which is to say that, you know, we are trying to leave our uh, and this is a lot of the feeling of the Constitution. These are, at some level, relics of a sort of pre-modern past, all of these caste identities, religion identities. We're going to be this new modern people. So at one level, at an descriptive level, yes, we are this and that caste. But there's clearly a sort of, you know, a, a cognitive force in the Constitution which is pushing us towards this idea of a kind of universalist sort of... Uh, modern citizenship. So we have to leave this sort of background. So is this question then of this ascription of disadvantage and of minority uh, a question that is temporary? And the very nature of things, it will somehow in, 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 in time cure itself. And so we will all be good, full Indians and not have these relic identities. Uh, so here too, uh, I'm, I'm the question of when one thinks about or theorizes kind of political movement around this, you know, are we trying to say that, fine, all this problem will be solved if, I don't know, we all get enough broadband or whatever, right? So, I mean, so it's, if it's not that, if it's not about a disadvantage that will dissolve itself in time with a, you know, a charitable enough government, then how does one make the case for difference, right? If the whole argument is only about right now, there is, some people are out of the, uh, out of the scope of this and at some point we will all get in, then how does one actually, because I mean, traditionally the idea is that you will reach this ground, this common ground, let's say the constitution or some sort of utopic sort of space, and then we will still meet as different people. Here it's not clear what access and citizenship in this, dif in this digital world is, where how does one conceptualize both that meeting space as well as the, r the retention of differences too, right? I mean, there is a massive homogenizing force of it. So fine, we all want to get on the, you know, whatever information superhighway. And let's assume we all get on it. Will that solve the problem, right? Because then how does one also conceptualize difference that you don't want to, that you don't want to let go? Because that is the basis, of, in a way, of your identity. So I was actually struck by the remarks yesterday on, on forms of silence, on forms of um, curating silence, I think was well-chosen phrase and very different kinds of participation and different kinds of keeping a foot in both worlds and all of that, right? So I don't want the whole debate to be hijacked purely at the question of, you know, access and numbers and, you know, how much is, you know, how much, how much, uh, how fast your internet speed has to be so that you're free or something like that, right? I mean, all of the other thinking about what actually belonging in the sphere is, is, is still has to, is, we're almost repressing those questions because we're saying, oh, look, there is so much lack of equality and access to, right? So I don't want questions of access and, you know, comfort levels to hijack the question of in this digital world, how are we going to actually maintain, you know, differences? Call it cultural if you like to load it, um, but whatever, some notion of difference, right? Some notion of, of difference and, and as well as participation, right? Okay. Uh, the question of minorities, again, um, 
of again, you know, the, the few people who are given that status, other than, so they were basically religion, and then there was castes and tribals. They often said uh, they were they did not want to be, and I found this interesting and resonant in a way. The, the, some of the tribal, the people who are representing the tribal, said that we did we are not minorities, and the case that they made was more about a, a very primordial. Uh, sort of relationship to the land, like we were the original people. That's why we are not, because we are given this political category of a minority. And we don't want to fight this war under that banner, but in terms of a primordiality. So again, you know, what is it? I think it's connected to this question of silences and the kind of self-presence or <laughs> self-presencing in the internet, because it's this question of, how, of where we are located when we make this sort of claim, right? So it's not, again, the government or whatever, the market ascribing things to us, but based on what kind of primary claim are we making this case to be part of this sort of commons, right? Okay. Um, so, so, I want to, yeah, so I want to talk about what does cultural difference on the internet meaningfully mean? It's not to say that, you know, uh, you know, I like the set of movies and you like that set of movies, but if you actually think of, of what it means to actually l inhabit that space to whatever extent and still maintain difference online, offline, how does one, you know, it's not just about governments and regulatory environments, all of which are, you know, incredibly important, but uh, I think what is the positive imagination of this space? Again, I don't mean it just in the euphoric sense of I can upload ten, ten hundreds of photographs or whatever, but, but in the sense of what new politics would that entail, what new relationships would that entail. So I think we need to just imagine that um, in, in a more, you know, grounded sort of way, right? Okay. Um, and again, to go back to some of the old debates, just because I found a lot of it relevant in terms of conceptualizing a political agenda, the, you know, the right of distinctness you know, just because you're culturally distinct does not entitle you to state protection necessarily. So, I mean, how does one, Trump, you know, if you translate the Constitution onto, you know, sort of take it by an aeroplane, I suppose, into a digital world, then uh, how does one, what is the balance one is striking between, you know, the old problems of, you know, I want to map cultural distinctness, but I also want to prohibit, you know, there's an old debate about the state being neutral or the state being interventionist, about how does one adjudicate in terms of all of the questions. So untouchability will be banned, but a whole bunch of other questionable religious practices, you know, which actually the Constitution listed. You know, it's quite incredible to keep listing lots of random practices. Um, and the word practice is also interesting because there was a fight about the word practice. People said religious practice, and they said, no, no, religious worship. So one of, actually, the question of faith and belief is very interesting in a digital world, right? Not, you know, what does it mean to believe in that sort of world, right? So again, how does one regulate this kind of world, right? What is the, what is the, you know, the cultural, if you like, or political imagination of this world? Beyond, so I think, I'm, I'm sensitive to the, to the, to all the, the narratives of oppression and conspiracy. I mean, they're all real, and we've had many eloquent testimonials to this, but I also think it's equally a challenge to, uh, you know, to actually imagine more positive sort of civic spaces, right, in that sort of world. And what did, and how, just that we've had to keep visiting these questions of balancing, is a very classical political philosophy question of the trade-off between justice and liberty. You know, how would this sort of dimension, um, you know, how would it reflect in that sort of world? How much time do I have, sorry? Couple of minutes, yeah. Um, okay. I actually found, I mean, these are just a few related to this. The the Big Brother, somebody said we grew up in 1984 and the Big Brother thing. And I think that was actually interesting because if you look at the Constitution, the elder brother is the, the most wonderful person, right? Because, you know, like Lord Ram was the elder brother. And it was always about the rhetoric of the elder brother, right? It was always about, you know, uh, you know, your big brother to Pakistan, basically, at that point. And, you know, so this question of, you know, I mean, this very majoritarian, clearly, way of sort of being the big brother, the good big brother to a lot of these sort of, you know, so how does one manage hierarchy on the net, you know, I mean, or hierarchy in the digital world? And what role does the state, because, you know, big brother is a totally different connotation here. I mean, it actually, because we've had, a, you know, most, Indians, for the most part, want a pretty paternalistic state. I mean, that's the dominant, you know, 
sort of note in a lot of, and certainly in, uh, that was the way that the state saw itself, right? Very much, very much telling people at some level, at the level of, you know, national unity, Trump's everything else, that sort of rhetoric. So we don't really have such a old sort of um, rhetoric of actual fear of, uh, you know, political tyranny. I mean, we don't really have the, you know, the, the reign of terror kind of like we don't have a model of political tyranny really in 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 India. I mean, you have colonialism maybe sort of, but I mean, this is a larger political philosophy question. What is the rhetoric again of and of anti tyranny, right? We don't have it. I mean, there is no pre forty seven India in a meaningful sense. So where will you derive a real notion of tyranny and and consequently the uh, a, a cure from tyranny from, right? Because we've not gone through you know, a lot of political history which is sort of, we just inherit in a way from Europe, right? So, so um, yeah, you said a few minutes, so I'll be done. Thank you.